namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa <coughs> namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Murang damang sangang namasami. <coughs> I only have to start talking and my voice is already gone. <laughs> so forgive me, I have a little bit of a cold as well. Okay. <coughs> what I wanted to uh, talk about this evening is... Uh, probably a subject that yeah has been talked about quite a lot and, and but I kind of like it because it's my favorite sutta and uh, also because my teacher Arjun Brahm has uh, has used that sutta when he was in a six months retreat and he was chanting it several times a day um, and that was the only sutta he took with him and that's the Anathalakana sutta um, so I like that one very much um, it's actually uh, not that long, it's fairly repetitive, but that's a teaching tool that the Buddha always used and uh, probably used in that society quite a lot uh, because that way we really learn and understand it and can memorize it because uh, they didn't have printed books in those days, so they had to, uh, to memorize everything. So that's easier when it's repeated several times with the same same thing, and we tend to abbreviate things in books and go like dot 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 uh, as above, uh, but uh, there they didn't. So, so this uh, sutta is about the five khandhas, the five quite often translated as aggregates, groups. Uh, neither of those translations is, is very great, but it, it basically means that. Uh, the Buddha took uh, the entirely entirety of our experience and divided it into some groups that we could um, understand and understand that they, those things are not who we are, they're not ourself. And then you see at the end that basically the, our whole experience of, of who we are and what we are, it, it's just not, uh, not existent basically. And so, so let's start, and I'll, I'll illustrate things with, with some of my own experiences uh, where that, uh, that feeling of, of who we are actually uh, comes to be and where, that, uh, uh, where you can see that. Um, so the first one is, is rupa, a form. Um, so basically our body. And quite often we, we yeah, when we were not, I've never heard of the Buddhist teachings, we quite often think that, yeah, our body is us. Uh, when we've heard of the Buddhist teachings before, then we know that this is not true. We can see it changing constantly. We can see that at some point it will die. Um, we can see it getting old. We can see that our body looks very different right now than when we were a baby. But then we think like, oh yeah, I understand that. So that's not self. But... The real test is, is when your body gets threatened. So when your doctor tells you you've got terminal cancer, how do you react? Um, or in, in, in my case, it was something that happened to me two weeks ago. I uh, came around a corner and I was in uh, Arizona, by the way, in, a, in the desert. And um, I came around the corner and uh, around the rock and uh, I heard a sound. And now in, I come from Holland, I come from Europe. Um, that's a sound that I've never heard in my life before. And yet my body seemed to know what to do and that meant run. <laughs> <laughs> and what it was, it was a rattlesnake. So, uh, and, and basically, um, I was later told that the rattlesnake just tries to kindly make me aware of its presence and uh, tell me that I'm in its space and it's scared. 
he doesn't like this. So, but my immediate reaction was like, run. <laughs> because, yeah, that's... Uh, the body react. I, I didn't think about that. It, it was an automatic reaction. This is a survival instinct that comes up. And Derek's like, oh, I'm still somewhat attached to this body. I still there somewhere think that this is me, that I have to protect. Um, I, I have a, a, a several of those, those, those snake stories, so I'll just tell them to you. <laughs> It's another time when I was in Burma and um, I had a little kuti, that's so this little um, hut. Um, and I went back to my hut after the meditation and it was incredibly hot. So I took off my, my robes and so I basically uh, in my underwear. <laughs> and I went to a little fountain that I had in, in, in this hut because uh, we did have some water there to splash some cold water in my face. and. When I did that, I noticed there was something moving by my fit, my bare feet. And I looked down and there was this big um, fluorescent green snake. And the immediate reaction without thinking to, was to, to run backwards and then thinking like, oh, I can't run out the door without anything on. <laughs> but uh, luckily the snake also thought the better of it and just disappeared out, out, uh, out through a little crack in the wall and uh, didn't pursue going after me. And I later learned that snakes can be extremely fast and that you can't outrun them uh, if you try. So um, that's what happened to me another time in Australia when I was, um, uh, now Australia has a lot of quite deadly snakes. Uh, so it's just walking uh, with just flip-flops and bare feet uh, over a little forest path to my kuti and out came this snake from uh, right to left over the path right in front of my feet very very fast I didn't have time to think about it and then I stopped and I was like, that was a red belly black snake those are very very poisonous they didn't apparently want to attack me I just wanted to cross the path but uh, yeah, th th that's the moment that I think, oh, hold on, there is something that's still quite attached to this body as really scared of losing that. And so, so yeah, there's still this sort of se sense of self. It's like, this is my body and I have to protect it. Um, so things like that, you tend to, uh, you can see where that sense of self still manifests. So the second one, um, Vedana, the feelings, uh, just um, one step back also. Uh, the, the Buddha uh, also has a lovely sutta, I think it's some Yutanikaya 22, 95, I'm not entirely sure, but uh, it's called the Lump of Foam. And um, it, it's, um, it, it's Rela it, it, it gives a simile for all these five khandas, for all these five groups. And the, the, ex the, 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 the form, the, the body, he, um, the simile for that is that it's like a lump of foam on the river Ganges, that there's no substance in it as well. So you can imagine that uh, also here you probably sometimes have these lumps of foam on a river which are algae and uh, yeah, there's nothing much to that really. That's, it's just, well, basically air. And that's basically what he said, that's our body is, it's insubstantial, it's not, uh, but still, we tend to hang on to it, even though it's insubstantial, then, and he tried in all kinds of ways to tell us, like it changes, it's uh, insubstantial, and yes, we can see that intellectually, but still, when something happens, that's when you really learn, like, where is that self? Um, so the second one is Vedana. Uh, so it's feeling, um, it, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's translated as feeling, but it's, it's basically that uh, aspect of every experience that is pleasant, um, not pleasant or neutral. So not just the feelings on the skin or something like that, or um, 
but uh, also the feeling for instance if you see something beautiful and you go like oh that this kind of feeling that's also part of it uh, so it has to do with all the all the senses basically um and the buddha uh, has a simile for that as well and it's like when a raindrop falls in a puddle it's plop and it's gone um if you do um, uh, yeah, retreats that, that use uh, or meditation techniques that use this, this uh, like body scanning, uh, Gwenka techniques, things like that, you can see after a while, it's like, oh yeah, this is really true. There's all these uh, feelings everywhere, constantly in our body. Every month, even though you're in our daily life not aware of it, but this, these feelings, they are there and they, they go very quickly. They come up and they go again and it goes very rapidly. Um, there are other feelings, maybe you have some pain and some people have like chronic pain, of course. That's sometimes a bit more difficult to, to deal with. But if you start to see into it, if you stay you can stay with that, uh, with that experience, you see that it's not a constant, it's not one thing. It, it's made up out of, yeah, there's places where it's a little bit more, places where it's a little bit less. And so you can investigate like that. And but quite often we also think that these feelings are mine, even though they're, they're quite, um, yeah, they, they come and go. But that's not where there is a, they're not me, mine, myself. They're not my feelings, it's not my pain. It's just pain. This body has pain but it's not who I am, it's not my pain. Um, and if you, yeah, like uh, I come from a science background, I studied geophysics and uh, uh, yeah, then you, especially in, in physics, you know, you probably know from high school physics that uh, the, the Bohr model of like the, the molecules and the atoms, etc., and uh, you can also see that is, uh, yeah, what what is really going on there with all the, these molecules in our body, that um, it is it, very insubstantial actually. When you start like dissecting it like that, it's like, well, it doesn't really, um, yeah, there's nothing really there. And it's the same with the, with the feelings. And um, maybe that's a, actually a better uh, example for the body itself, for the, for the first one, for the Rupa. But um, yeah, for the feelings, it's also the same way. Uh, it, it's very insubstantial and it just comes and goes. And it, it's not, yeah, it doesn't, uh, doesn't stay. Even if you have like chronic pain, it's constantly there, it will eventually go as well. Um, at the latest when you die, it's so maybe not the most um, comforting thought, but still, um, th there's this story from uh, Ajahn Brahm as well, when he had, um, uh, I think it was typhoid fever, and he was lying in hospital in, in Thailand, and uh, uh, especially in the 60s, that or 70s, there wasn't, uh, the hospitals weren't very good in these rural areas. So he, he was just very ill. They didn't know what it was. And he was there actually for a whole month. And at some point his teacher, Ajahn Shah, came to see him. So he was like, oh wow, my teacher comes to see me. Wow, that's wonderful. And uh, Ajahn Shah just stood at the end of his bed and just said, you're either gonna get better or you die. And then turned around and then walked out again. <laughs> And he said that was actually a really good teaching, but his bedside manners were not that great. <laughs> <laughs> and again, so the third one, perception, Sanya. Um, I think you can all, all see that, that how, how that changes. And um, like one day you haven't slept very well, you're feeling drained, you. Uh, you feel a bit depressed and everything looks gloomy. You have these dark gl colored glasses on all the time. And uh, yeah, you can't enjoy anything at all. And the next day you slept really well and everything looks rosy well, and everything looks wonderful and everything goes just perfect. Because you have these rose colored glasses on 
or there's another person that you feel really attracted to you see them only through like rose-colored glasses because they're like such a wonderful person and uh, how, how uh, wonderful to, uh, uh, to to know them and you don't see the negative sides of that person at all <laughs> and we all have them so we, uh, we all are, have negative sides and positive sides but so what we need to do is just take that those glasses off and see if people what what they really are um, so that's that's basically perception is what the buddha also said uh, uh, in that that simile is it's a mirage in the desert um so i'm going to the sahara desert in november apparently so i'm i'm looking forward to also seeing a mirage <laughs> but uh, um th this is also uh yeah this basically what we're seeing is is not what is there we're seeing something we think but it's not what what's really there because we always have these these glasses on in one way or another sometimes they're uh, yeah rose-colored glasses and other times they're dark glasses and we get just very depressed and everything's gloomy so if we just remember to take those glasses off uh that there's another side to the story one way of doing that actually is for instance if you feel quite uh, negative and depressed just start looking at all the positive things start looking at beautiful flowers uh pet the cat uh anything that is positive and beautiful even though in the beginning it's a bit difficult to get into it that's why you start to balance things out a bit and come get a bit in a better mood as well and the other way around as well then if you think everything is wonderful and, and beautiful then yeah maybe you are very attracted to something and you have a lot of desire to something just tend to look at all the negative or the drawbacks as well because then you start to balance things out and see things how they really are and really appreciate things how they really are rather than to hang on to one view or another view so the, the fourth one, Sankara, is a bit more difficult to translate. Uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi uses mental formations, Bhante Vijata uses choices. I'm, I'm not entirely sure about the word choices there. I know where it comes from, but uh, I, I think it doesn't make it very clear. Uh, and it, it, it's a difficult one to, to translate. One part of... Um, a big part of sankara is our will uh, which is often translated or which is the pali word chaitana and that's also where that word choices come from from our will we, we make choices um, and we often think like oh that will that is mine um uh, i'm i'm the one who does i'm the one who who, who uh, wills free will very important in this country <laughs> is your will really free is it yours? Where does it come from? No, it's conditioned. It's conditioned like anything else. Um, you're, um, for instance, all the stuff I'm saying now, where does that come from? Well, I didn't make it up. It comes from, for a large part, from my teacher, Ajahn Brahm. Um, and he also says, like, oh, I, I don't give the talks, it's my teacher, Ajahn Shah, and so it goes back all the way to the Buddha. So that's where there's a, a strain on of conditioning there. It's not original. It, nothing is ever, ever original. Um, there's um, uh, an article I read once, um, and I, I forget for who the author was, but... Um, about how everything every book that's ever been written is not original is always a, a, a bit of a changing of the words of, of, of what we have read and before and which has gone to our uh, per perception as well we've changed it a little bit based on other things we've heard and 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 read etc and then we come up with something that we write but it's not never original so yeah where does this free will come from well 
it's, it's not really free. It's also conditioned. It comes from our parents. It comes from our teachers. It comes from um, our society. If you were born in a different country, in a different culture, your will would be very, very different. So is that yourself? Is that who you are? Is that... Yet that will is what does things, which prompts us to do things. So I sit in meditation and you, you want to do something. You want to uh, pay attention to this or pay attention to that, rather than to stop and to just observe things as they are. You want to your meditation to be different. You want to have this wonderful, quiet, loving meditation, uh, and yet you have all these thoughts. And you can't stop these thoughts. You might want to stop the thoughts, it doesn't work. <laughs> um, and, and the more you try to stop them, the more thoughts you're gonna get. So, yeah, it's, look a bit further and see as what is this, this wanting is is wanting to, to be changed and just accept the things, how things are in this very moment. And that's basically what it is, being in the present moment with mindfulness, that's the meditation, and just to, to look at what is going on right now, rather than to want to change things. And then see what a wanter is, what this doer is. And the Buddha compared this one to um, uh, a banana tree. Because, and because if you cut down a banana tree, uh, those of you who've never done so, <laughs> it, there's no hardwood in it. It's um, completely, it's the, it, insubstantial basically. There's nothing really there. If you want to build something, um, you can't use a banana tree because there's no wood in it basically that you can use. So it, it's, it's also insubstantial and you can't really use it. So that's what he compared that one to. And the last one is um, actually the most interesting one and also the one where we get most uh, idea of where what ourself is one, whether you're not the one who does things or wants things, well, we're the one that knows things. We're observing, so we know and that's, even though, um, yeah, and so the last one's called Vinyana, so quite often translated as consciousness or consciousness as, yeah, as my teacher also says, there's like six consciousnesses, and I think in some teachers will explain that differently, but um, you have the, the a consciousness for each of the senses, basically. You have the eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, etc. Um, and there's also the mind consciousness. And so they, they, you have actually uh, three words here that are, op that are uh, quite often used for that which knows, and that's this mind consciousness. Um, but it can also, um, quite often the word, the three words in mano, vinyana and, and chitta, they are quite often used as sort of synonyms in the early Buddhist texts. Uh, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, the Buddha uh, had this uh, simile for this one as a magician's trick. So uh, it, it's, it's tricking you to see things, or you're, you're observing things, you're seeing things, but what you're observing, is that really true? What do you think you know? Is that really true? Is that you? Are you the knower? Are you that which knows? It, it really feels like that. But the Buddha says, no, it's not. It's, it's not who you are. It's uh, also changing. It's also anicca. It's, it's, um, um, it will disappear at some point. And for that, you have to have like very strong meditation. After a while, if you uh, are entering uh, jhanas, then at some point, this, 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 this vinyana also stops. 
And then you can, when you come back out, you can reflect back and go, oh, hold on, there was something that was missing that wasn't there before. And that is this, this mana vinyana. Now, I said there's another word called chitta, which is often used uh, in synonym uh, with this, but there are other forest teachers to who see that a little bit different. And they'll say that the chitta is not within these groups, kandas, but in, and not without it, but in the middle. And personally, I don't quite know what that would mean. Uh, and I haven't been trained in those traditions, but I do want to mention it because it's something that you will probably come across at some point if you are uh, continuing in Buddhism, if you haven't already. Um, so it's um, so just to know that there is different different ideas about these things. And for for some time, I was like, well, what should I believe? I mean, there's this one great teacher and this other great teacher and they're all great teachers and uh, who, who should I believe and uh, then I think of this this story of um, the Buddha when when he went to Mahamogalana he's one of his chief disciples and he gave him a teaching and Mahamogalana uh, and afterwards he asked Mahamogalana and okay do you believe me and Mahamogalana said no I don't believe you now, this is what you say to the Buddha, right? No, I don't believe you. You're the chief disciple. I mean, uh, would you say that to your, your teacher that you really respect? Oh, I don't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the, the Buddha actually praised that. And the Buddha said, Sada, 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 it's wonderful that you, you, that you understand. Because you can't believe something you haven't experienced yet yourself. You can have faith that your teacher knows what they're talking about and then try and um yes you see like okay when i get to that stage i i've at least heard it once but you can you you don't know it until you've actually experienced it so for me as well i'm i'm it's when i uh, experience it then uh, I will know it. And so until that time, I just keep an open mind and I'll see what, what happens, <laughs> basically. So I think I'll, I'll leave it at that and we'll open the floor for some questions and answers. Sarukarang <laughs>